Hey guys, I hope everybody is doing well today. Please wave if you can hear us. All right, we got some people that can hear, so that's good. Um, so we've got a really special treat today. We're going to do a uh, an awesome lunch and learn, talking about appraisals and uh, everything that goes into that. Uh, I am going to give it like one more minute for people to get here. I, I know we've got a lot on here already, and uh, probably got a few more that are going to be connected. But um, also, guys, if you have questions down in the bottom of your screen, I think it says chat, and uh, you can type your questions over here on the right, and we will uh, we'll be able to see those and. Uh, we may answer some of them as we go, or we may wait till the end to answer some. Oh, also, please, if you want to uh, put in your, your license number in the chat room, uh, name and license number, that will allow us to give you your CE credit. You have to have your license number to get your uh, continuing education. So you can do that. So who's excited? Everybody jump up and down, right? All right, got a couple of people excited. I like it. Um, so guys, uh, there's several loan officers that work here in our office. Of course, me, I'm, I'm Chris Haynes. Thank you if you're my guest coming out today. Uh, we got Mitch Malahan, Mitch the man, he'll wave over there. Uh, Clint Haynes is my brother. He's been doing this for a long time. I've been doing it 16 years, he's been doing it 15. Uh, he's actually at a, uh, a Leadership Wilson, I think today, so he's not here. Uh, ben Braun, I don't know if I see Ben. I can't see everybody, uh, but Ben Braun's on here, so he invited you. Alex uh, Robertson. An amazing loan officer as well. There he is, smiling and cheesing and waving. Uh, Daryl, uh, Daryl, you here? Daryl Harvey, I can't see you, but I'm sure he's here. And of course, Brandy, uh, she's in here with us. So if uh, Brandy on my team invited you, uh, definitely say thank you to them. And uh, we're excited for today. So we have a special treat. I've got uh, Brian Montgomery, he owns the Montgomery Appraisals. And uh, Tanner Bates, he is uh, on the team there and he does a lot of the, uh, the actual work and reports. And uh, so a couple of quick things before I start, and I'm going to give it over to them, and they're going to, uh, to go through how appraisals work and, and things like that. So real quick, can everybody hear me okay? You might not hear. Hey, right. Chris, we, we might want to make sure everybody gets mute, mutes themselves during this process. Yeah, please please mute yourself. That way, you know, if there's any feedback or uh, if you're like me, when I work at home, my, my four-year-old comes screaming into the room. Uh, it's a lot of fun. So. Um, but anyway, so a couple of things I want to touch on before I turn it over to them. Uh, at People Some Equity, we have a very unique uh, way that we do business in, in the way of appraisals. So uh, I've been with the company for 16 years, and they've allowed us to um, set up our appraisal panel. And I picked out the, the, the best five appraisers that, that I've ever worked with. And these guys are on that panel. The reason they're on that panel is because they're, they're the best. Now, Appraisals have to be ordered through an appraisal management company, so I can't pick which appraiser is going to get each one. But I know if it's in Wilson County that Brian and his team are probably going to get 50% or so uh, of the conventional appraisals that are ordered in Wilson County. So he has a really good chance of getting your appraisals. If it's in Davidson County, I've got two guys. There's a good chance that, uh, that, that one of my two guys are going to get it there. If you're out in Smith County or you know, further out in Dixon or something like that, it won't be these guys. They're not going to go to Dixon. Uh, so it won't be those main guys. But in Davidson, Wilson, and the surrounding counties, uh, you're going to have a very limited list. And what that allows us to do is pick the best. If it's Bank of America, I shouldn't say any bank's name, but if it's a big bank, they may have 100 appraisers on their list. And you just don't know what you're getting. Every time it's going to be different because, uh, you know, they don't have the best of the best that, that work with them. Um, another quick point, guys. Who thinks when an appraisal comes low, it comes in low, it's the end of the world and the deal is going to die? Does anybody ever feel like that? Like, oh no, the appraisal came in low, right? Uh, it's not, never a fun thing, but I, I'll tell you this thing. These guys don't try to, to bring in anything low. If the value is justifiable, don't let them touch on it. Uh, they will do a great job and bring it in. But when an appraisal comes in low, it is super important that you look at that as an opportunity to save your client's money. If you say, hey, great news, guys, we may be able to save $8,000 on this appraisal because the appraisal came in low, we would save you $8,000 on the purchase price. That's a whole different attitude and a different way to look at it versus, um, oh, no, the appraisal came in low and the deal might die. Does, does that make sense? So I, I'll give you an example. This happens, uh, has happened to me repeatedly. Uh, an appraisal comes in low, and of course, everybody's like, oh, no, the appraisal you know, came in low, it may, you know, may have to kill the deal or whatever. Uh, we go to the seller and we talk to the seller and the seller's like, yeah, we knew we kind of had it overpriced. 
we were just trying to get the most we could. And yeah, that, that seems like a fair appraisal. And immediately they dropped the price. So my suggestion, if you're representing a buyer, is when an appraisal comes in low, is go to the seller and ask for a price reduction. Now we're gonna talk about reconsiderations if we think it's justifiable. We're gonna talk about how to get reconsiderations, especially when you're working with a big bank, how to hopefully overcome those. Um, but that's the best thing to do. Does that make sense? Ask for the price reduction. You will get it more often than you won't. Because uh, people know that the appraisers are trying to do a great job and they already know the comps uh, a lot of times. And the last thing I wanna talk about is the market. You know, when markets are going up, me and you as buyers and sellers, we can look into the future and we can say, hey, I believe this house is going to go up in value. Therefore, I'm willing to pay more for it now because I think in three years, the thing's going to be worth $30,000, dollars $50,000 more than it is today. Well, appraisers can't do that. So think of it like a boat you know, going down the water. Me and you are in the front of the boat looking at where we're going. Appraisers are in the back of the boat and they can only see what's in the past. So they can only look at comps that have happened. And that's what they have to use to determine the value. They can't say, well, the market's going up, so I'm just going to add $10,000 to the value because I know it's going to go up. They can't do that. I have to look at what comps have already closed. Does that make sense? All right. So uh, without further ado, uh, we got the best two appraisers here that we can possibly have. And I'm just going to start by asking a question. So uh, I think you guys all have the, uh, the, the questions uh, in front of you. And uh, Brian's probably gonna lead it, Tanner will probably jump in some too. But uh, the first question we're gonna look at, and we're also gonna do a screen share of actual appraisals here in a little while. Uh, but the, the first question is a very common mistake I see people make, and it is price the square, per square foot the best way to determine value on a home? And can you look at a particular neighborhood and figure out the average price per square foot to, term, to determine the value on a home? So can you touch on that and how homes are bracketed? I'd be glad to. Uh, first of all, Chris, I'd like to thank you for allowing us the opportunity to come in and meet with y'all today and to speak with every one of you. I always look forward to the opportunity to be able to talk with agents and kind of help explain the appraisal process for familiarity with them and, and also the opportunity to be able to speak with y'all uh, and learn from y'all at the same time. Um, but the short and long answer to that question is yes and no. Uh, there are some instances where price per square foot does play a big factor in certain neighborhoods. Other neighborhoods, it's, it's not as big of a driving force when we're looking at it as, you know, just because it's in this neighborhood, it's gonna fall somewhere in that 150 to 160 price per square foot range. Kind of the, well, the majority of the time, um, what we look at is, is not price per square foot. Just to give you an instance, uh, say here in, in Mount Juliet over in Jackson Hills, over here off of Curve Road, there's still a lot of new construction going on, new houses being built regularly that offer a tremendous amount of options and upgrades and stuff like that. You may have the same house plan, but you may have five different elevations of that same house plan. You may have unlimited options of upgrades for as an extra 10 by 10 patio on the back of the house or an upgraded hardwood. There, there's a lot of different factors that really influence that price per square foot. So you can't go in and say that all the new construction houses in that neighborhood are at 150 to $155 per square foot whenever you're going out to price something because there's so many options, buyers are willing to pay premiums for different things, lot premiums. Uh, so you may have the same exact house, floor plan, looks the same on the outside, but it may have a, 10, 20, 30, $50,000 price difference, sales price difference. So if you were just to rely strictly on price per square foot, you're either gonna way overvalue similar houses or you're gonna way undervalue similar houses because they all have a lot of different unique characteristics that have caused them to sell for what they have. So, you know, um, a neighborhood that you could rely a little bit more on price per square foot, for an example, would be maybe Willoughby Station. Uh, it's an older development, you know, no new construction per se going on in that neighborhood anymore. And the market has had time to absorb all the different prices that the buyers paid initially for all the upgrade features. So the upgraded 10 by 10 patio may not contribute the same value right. 20 years ago that it does today. Yep. Uh, so things have kind of offset. Everything's pretty much, you know, you don't pay the lot premiums in there like you do 
over here in Jackson Hills or in a new subdivision right now. So the long and short is yes and no. Uh, we try to never look at it that way. Yeah. So it sounds like in a subdivision, an existing subdivision that's 10 years old established, you got 200, 300, 500 houses, you got a bunch of comps. Mm -hmm. It's going to be easier to come up with that value and, and more based on a price per square foot versus a two acre house that's not in a subdivision that's five miles from town. Yes. You yes. cannot go price per square foot. No, no. And a lot of agents, you know, a lot of people, that's what they do. They'll just say, well, the average, if you look at this zip code, the average is this, and they try to come up with the value. So he's going to get in more into bracketing yeah. and, uh, and things like that. So any, anything else on the price per square foot or you want to go to question two? Yeah, let's go on with question two. So question two, guys, is how do home improvements affect value? He just talked about, you know, in the new construction. And, you know, maybe touch on this, too, on this question. Um, sometimes I've seen people way over improve a new construction house. I'm talking, and it doesn't appraise. You think, oh, it's new construction. It's going to appraise for the cost. And it's just not true. If you go overboard, even on a new construction, sometimes, like, there aren't comps to support it. You know, if you put in a gold countertop, um, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect the cost, but it doesn't affect the value you know, as much. So, you know, why the cost of some improvements not increase the value of the home as much as others uh, and take into an account like a detached garage and a pool? I know I put in a detached garage. It's been six years ago. And, um, you know, I talked to an appraiser at that time, and I was lucky to get 50 cents on the dollar for what it cost me versus what it added to the value of my appraisal. And I love my detached garage. If I get in trouble, that's where I stay. You know, my wife kicks me out of the house for a few days. But uh, that's a joke. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, it's worth it to me to pay what it costs because I get to enjoy it. But I understand on an appraisal, it's not going to add dollar for dollar what it costs me. Uh, so can you touch on yeah, I'm glad to. So first thing is dollar for dollar cost never creates dollar for dollar value. Um, appraisal theory whenever we're making adjustments and giving value to different things, it's all based on what your average willing and knowledgeable buyer is willing to pay extra for something, which is most cases is rarely ever 100% of what something would cost. Uh, look at it this way. If you have two houses that are identical to each other, everything about them exactly the same, nothing different. The only exception is a swimming pool. One has a swimming pool, one does not have a swimming pool. Both of them are on the market listed the same day, uh, available to a willing buyer. 50% of the population likes pools, 50% of the population does not like pools or don't care that much about them. So what is the average person willing to pay extra for that exact same house just because it has a pool? You know, you can't go build a decent pool anymore. I mean, you're you're starting at sixty thousand plus. Yeah. You know, a lot of people spending eighty and hundred thousand dollars on a pool now. Um, if you're wanting a pool, build a pool because you want a pool, not because you're trying to add value to your house. Yeah. Uh, anything detached from a house, garage, uh, extra patios, uh, anything other than GLA, gross living area, is not going to get you dollar for dollar value. Most cases, what you alluded to a while ago is about right, 50 cents on a dollar most yeah. of the time, because that's about all anybody's willing to pay. Everybody wants a bargain on something. But, um, so basically, if you, if you have somebody that, you know, and I hear that argument all the time, you know, if we're doing a refinance for somebody like, hey, we paid 300 for the house and we spent 80,000 on the pool, it should be worth 380,000. And I know immediately that that's not the case. So. Uh, and we'll talk about that here in a minute when we bracket. He'll, he'll probably show you the line that he actually looks at to make an adjustment. So he's going to look at houses and say, well, first you want to find houses that have had a pool. Exactly. To comp it. If there aren't houses that have a pool, they literally just have to make an adjustment. And uh, you know, I've seen fifteen to twenty thousand dollar adjustments for eighty thousand dollar pools. Right. And and that that's one of the things I'd like to touch touch base there on. Um, in order to get the maximum value out of a, an additional improvement that you make to a property, whether it be a swimming pool or a garage or anything else, there have to be other comparable sales that have sold in that same neighborhood with those same improvements that you can use as comparables. Yep. That's how you're going to get the maximum amount of value out, or contributory value out of an extra feature, which we refer to stuff like that as extra features. 
uh, if you don't have, if you're in a neighborhood that is all predominantly pool, has the majority of houses have pools, uh, you're going to get more value out of your pool than if you're in a neighborhood that typically doesn't have pools. Yeah. You've got more sales to choose from that have those same features. Then you can start putting together what we refer to as a paired sales analysis, where we find houses that are as similar as possible that have all the same features as similar as possible. Then we go through and make adjustments to those to, to actually figure out what kind of contributory value was given to that pool. And we have different ways, and we'll touch base over that in a minute, that we're able to extract exactly how much a pool will contribute to a certain subdivision or exactly how much an extra half bath will have. We have different yeah. ways that we're able to go through and decipher and do regression analysis to determine exactly how much contributory value is given to different Awesome. So, and one thing I want to ask too, um, I hear people like overbuilding for the neighborhood. So what he's touching on is, you know, if the neighborhood, let's say there's a neighborhood with 500 homes and the average house is 2,000 to 3,000 square feet, and then you have a one-off that's a 3,500 square foot or 4,000 square foot house that's in the neighborhood and has a pool and is completely overbuilt, it's really hard to compare those houses and appraise. So, you know, when you're buying a house as an investor, what I want to be is the smallest house in the neighborhood. You know, be the smallest house because generally over time they go up more in value. Uh, and you know, when you're advising your buyers, there's nothing wrong with buying a big house. If you're gonna live there for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years and enjoy it, that's great. But if you're looking at it from an investment standpoint, you don't want to be the the biggest, nicest, most overbuilt house in the neighborhood. It's always gonna be hard to appraise. It is. You know, the, the thing is if you're the biggest, nicest of anything in a neighborhood all of your comparables that you're gonna be comped out against during the appraisal or during the sale that when a buyer is going in looking in that neighborhood, everything else is inferior. So they're selling for lower prices. So you're never gonna be able to get that value right. out of it that what it would be worth sitting in a different subdivision surrounded by houses that are all more similar in size or larger. You hit a good point, the smaller end of the neighborhood, everything is bigger, in GLA, sales for more, that kind of brings your price up on the smaller house more so than it brings the, the larger house down in, a, in a, what we refer to as a super adequacy for that neighborhood. Right. Awesome. Um, so Tanner, I'm gonna ask you the next question if that's okay. So All right. uh, number three guys on your sheet is why do basement homes get a different value for the below grade square footage than, the, uh, than it does for the above grade? And then also, defining below grade. So a lot of people get uh, confused on what's below grade. I know in Hermitage, for example, there's a lot of houses that are split, split level. You walk in and it's above grade, you walk downstairs and there's a room that's basically below the dirt. And then there's a split level that goes upstairs too. And that downstairs, if it's below the dirt, that floor is below the dirt, you get a different value a lot of times anyway, in my experience on an appraisal. So can you touch on the basements and how that works? Yeah, so, um, you know, typically the, the first things we're looking at, um, you know, the, the major factor is is from a cost standpoint. So, um, so typically in order to, when you're building a basement from, from the ground up, from a cost standpoint, it is going to be cheaper because your, your major components of the home are already there. Um, and we're going to actually go to a, to a little um, a sheet from, from Fannie Mae that, it's kind of a guideline and it breaks down a little bit of the difference between above grade versus below grade GLA here. So, all right, we're going to share this right now, guys. So this is the from Fannie Mae that he's talking about. So this is, this is kind of differentiating um, the difference between above grade versus below grade in, in terms of, of what we call GLA or gross living area. So, you know, it simply states below grade finished square footage of a house is the sum of finished areas on levels that are wholly or partially below grade. So um, I know there's a lot of there's a lot of confusion about basements in terms of, um, well, I've got one wall that is, you know, slightly um, below grade. At that point in appraisal, you know, we have to treat that property as a basement home. You know, there may be three sides of the of the dwelling that is above grade essentially. But if you have one wall that is based on this here and what Fannie Mae indicates, 
then you know you have to treat that property as a basement home. Yeah, so any portion at all of that level is below grade. It doesn't matter if it's three inches. Any yeah. portion of it at all below grade per Fannie Mae, it is considered a basement house and has to be treated that way. Yeah, and that and guys like on a walkout basement, I've heard people um, you know, you got the you walk into the, the first level and then the, the, the downstairs it's on a slope. And they're like, well the whole back end of the house is you know above grade. I've got windows in the back, I can walk out. Lake homes have that a lot. But if the if the front of the house or any part of the house any part at all is below the dirt, the floor is below the dirt, Fannie Mae considers it below grade and therefore makes uh makes them appraise it that way. And and, and real quick before he finishes up on this part, I just want to touch on how hard an appraiser's job is. They are super highly regulated guys. Like they have to comply with all their own standards. And then they got the darn lender. You know, we have our standards. They got to know Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, USDA, VA, all the different things. And they have to comply with that. And then they have to stand behind their work for what, three years you can be called? Yeah, seven. seven years. So my bad. They, they have seven years that if the loan goes bad, what happens is five years later, the bank's going to say, well, hey, let me look why this loan went bad. And then they're going to call Brian and say, hey, I need you to come to go to court, right? You testify in court and say, how did you come up with this value? Tell me why you justified this house being worth what it was. And, um, you know, a big reason for that back in 2006, 7, and 8, there was a ton of fraud in appraisals. And uh, I've seen some crazy stuff where literally appraisers would manipulate pictures and live out square footage and turn it into the lender. And there was all kinds of stuff that went on that. These guys obviously were never part of that. I was never part of any of that, but that happened in 06, seven and eight. And we, we heard about it and that's what created a lot of the problems. And now because of it, they're highly, highly regulated. So, you know, that's one reason they are very strict or very, you know, sometimes hard to budge on, on what they can come up with. They can't, it's not just an opinion. Well, I think the house is worth something. Nope. This is what it's worth based on all the guidelines they have to follow to come up with a value. Yeah. And, and we have just, to be able to prove and justify any adjustment that we make in that appraisal. We have to have the data backing up showing that a certain adjustment is warranted based on sales in that neighborhood showing what those differences and similarities are. You know, and just to kind of drive home the the point on the um, the difference in value, you know, circling back to that, you know, um, when you when you when you view a basement, your your subfloor for your main level of your home is already there, so um, your flooring and your your foundation for your walls are already there, so a lot of the cost has already been absorbed because of the main level that that it was necessary to build those things anyway. So um, from a value standpoint, you have to look at it that way. And it's, um, and we'll go into um, a little bit more on, on how to, to value basements um, from a contributory value standpoint. We've got some, what he was talking about, paired sales data that, that shows um, what contributory value to that home is based on finished basement versus unfinished basement. So um, we'll go into that a little bit more on, on some examples here shortly. But, uh, but yeah. That, yeah. Did you have add on the basements? Is that yeah, it is, and I'll just expand just a little bit. You know, a lot of people don't understand that that you've got a two thousand square foot ranch house with a two thousand square foot basement. They think they have a four thousand square foot house. Right. Well, essentially, to the person living there or buying that house, yes, you do have four thousand square feet, but in appraisal standards, you've got a two thousand square foot house, and then you've got two thousand square feet of basement. Yeah. So, like what Tanner was saying. The cost of that basement, uh, the majority of it is already absorbed. You have to have the foundation. You have to have the block walls. Your floor is concrete. You know, you, you're going to put a covering over it. But the entire structure of a basement is all already factored in to what it costs to build the, your main level of the house. Right. You know, you're not having to build ad rackers or uh, joist or anything like that, shingles, all that's already taken care of up there. So the only cost that you have in a basement, yes, they are expensive. You know, I understand that, but you know, you're going to add a few extra blocks to get the height that you need. You're going to pour some concrete on the floor, a little extra plumbing, but your whole structure is already there based on the house. So your cost to build is a lot less. Uh, I know some people are, you know, whenever you contract a builder to build a house for you, they're charging you about the same amount of money. But a lot of those components are already there that are necessary for your above ground. 
Uh, so ANSI standards, you know, not excuse me, not ANSI, but Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, HUD, and all them, they detail, they know exactly what the costs are right. for every area. Uh, so whenever you go to making these adjustments, you have to revert back to what Tanner is fixing to show us here in just a minute, where we have prepared sales data showing exactly dollar for dollar what the contributory value and the components are for the unfinished basement versus the finished basement. Yeah, I think that's important too. You know, unfinished basement, you're going to get one value. And then a finished basement is just like the upstairs. It has to be drywalled in, has to be heated and cooled, it has to have a floor covering. Anything yeah. else? Put that, and in order to be considered living area in the basement, for FHA, USDA, rural loans, uh, anything like that, you have to have proper access in and out of that basement for safety hazards. You gotcha. know, bedrooms have to have a window in them. Uh, and they cannot be more than a certain distance, more than four foot off of the ground. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that come into play of what can actually be considered ceiling living. Ceiling yeah, ceiling height, height, well, minimum seven foot. Seven feet. Yeah. Okay, so good. Let's, um, guys, if it's okay, I'm going to go and look at some uh, some actual appraisals. So I'm, I'm sharing this with you, and uh, you know, who, whichever one of you guys want to kind of run through this. This is an actual appraisal that um, if you ever are looking at an appraisal report, this is the first thing that I go to. This is where you've got the subject property, which we scratched it out. Uh, you can see up here. Um, so, you know, we're not sharing any, any information here, but this goes around and I kind of want these guys, if, if we can, to go line by line and talk about, um, I can zoom this in a little bit more maybe. Um, hang on, hang on guys, I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing. All right, so line by line and, and look at, okay, this is what this property, the subject property, this is all the details on it. It's a seven bedroom, uh, seven total rooms with three bedrooms, two baths. Very, this is a very, somewhat of an easier uh, appraisal. This is comp number one. It was 1.69 miles away. Comp number two is only a quarter of a mile away. Comp number three, what they sold for, and then how they make adjustments. So if you guys can kind of walk us through the adjustments, because this is where, you know, the rubber hits the road on an appraisal. This is where you got to learn what you're looking at. It is, and just like you said, you nailed it. This is the only page anybody cares about in an appraisal. Uh, you know, this is where all the nuts and the bolts and everything are, and where it tells you bottom line what value was placed on that appraisal. Uh, you know, the first thing we do is whenever we're appraising a property, we go out, inspect that property, gather up all the pertinent information that we need, and then we start analyzing all the sales that have transpired in that same neighborhood over a 12 month period, 24 month period, and a 36 month period. Uh, you know, in, in this, we're not gonna be using sales two and three years old. We're gonna use the newer sales, but we wanna be able to keep up with it so we can show in regression how much, if any, appreciation is taking place in that market over a two and three year period. Uh, you know, what kind of demand cycles are going on in that neighborhood? Uh, a lot of different things we're looking at. We then narrow it down to what we feel like are the most comparable qualified sales that are available in that neighborhood for that property. Um, you know, just back over a qualified, what we consider just for all of y'all, uh, cause I know there's a question coming up here in a minute, but you know, a qualified comparable sale, number one is arm's length sale. We had to find something that was an arm's length transaction, no distress or anything like that. And just so everybody knows what an arm's length means, it's like, not arm's length if you're buying it from a family member or you know if it's a foreclosure that's not going to be a qualified sale so they have to find qualified sales where it's on the market and it's sold, sold for market for value, market value exactly. not distressed because they were moving to texas and had to close in a week exactly so these sales were the most similar in size you can see um, how close they are in, in size proximity uh, time of sale and everything else so the very first adjustment that we make uh is based on sales, financing, or concessions, if anything is atypical for that market, which all of these were similar, BA, FHA, one conventional, you can see just a little bit of seller participation paid of $5,000 on sale three, which is typical. Uh, you know, generally anything three and a half percent or less is considered typical for our market. Uh, all of them site varies a slight amount in, in site size, but the overall value of all of them is similar. You know, therefore, we didn't make an adjustment on that. Nothing. The market didn't deem that it was necessary. Yeah. That 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 two acre tract was selling any more than the acre and a half tracts. Yeah. So guys, just 
look at my cursor. So for site, our, our, our subject is 1.3 acres. The one next door is 1.4, 1.5, and this one's two. So there's no difference in value given. There might be a little bit difference in somebody's head, but exactly. on an appraisal, there's no difference in a 1.3 and a 1.5 acre track. What we have to take into consideration is the layout of each of these lots. You know, that two acre track actually had less road frontage than the subject's 1.3 acre track. Therefore, you don't have the options of being able to do something with it in the future like you possibly could have if you had 300 feet or so of yeah. road frontage. So a lot of different factors come into play, but overall the site value was deemed, you know, similar all the way across the board on each of those. Uh, if you scroll down to where you're seeing the Q4s, that's the quality rating that we assign to that particular property um, you know of the condition quality number one being the very best quality number six being the very worst your average quality uh, is going to be in that Q3 Q4 range yeah. very rarely do you ever see a Q1 type property in this area uh, and just guys so you look at it these are all Q4s but we did have an adjustment over here for number number three and a, and a negative adjustment means um, that that had a that's better than our subject. Yes, it is superior to the subject in terms of quality. So what that means, this one right here, guys, was $10,000 better quality on an adjustment than the one that we had. So yes. you may have looked at the MLS or did some research yes. and say, hey, this one's actually super recently renovated or whatever. So the quality of construction did have a, an adjustment right there. Yes. Uh, actual age, you know, these are 57, 59, 52, 65, no adjustments. These are all, you know, 50 to 60 year old houses, no adjustment there. A condition, if you want to touch on the C. The yeah, C3. so the C3 is, is kind of like it goes with the quality ratings. All of your condition, and all these are referring to as secondary market homes, obviously. Uh, C1 through C6 on your condition. C1 is a brand new house, never lived in. C6 is about to fall down, non livable. Uh, C3 is pretty much your average house, you know, that's been properly maintained and updated throughout time, uh, that functions well, you know, very much livable, no major components needing replacements or anything like that. Uh, this comparable number one had just been recently updated with some new floor coverings, uh, kitchen countertops and different things like that. And, you know, in our opinion was, you know, approximately somewhere around $7,500 superior value to what the subject is. And that's the thing to keep in mind. We never adjust the value of the subject. We're always adjusting the value of the comparables up or down to make them similar to the subject. So if you, but it, it's actually the, the subject would be 75 superior. Well, yes, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. The, the subject was $7,500 superior to, yeah. to comparable number one. So just to make sure we're clear, guys, the subject, when you get a plus, that means the subject was $7,500 better than, than the comp one. Because it's just it, it, you know this one maybe hadn't had anything done to it. It's a it's a 59 year old house and maybe it hadn't been updated for the last 30 years. Or 20 years. Um, the square footage. Uh, so the square footage and all these were were, were pretty similar. Uh, the adjustments that we made on the uh, size per square foot, typically anything 100 square feet or less, we don't make an adjustment on. The market yep. generally doesn't recognize. You know, you walk through a 2,000, 3,000 square foot house or a 1,600 square foot house, you're not going to see a 100 square foot difference in, in a house without somebody telling you. So I want to repeat that, guys, because I see a lot of people like, hey, I got a 1,630 square foot house and the comp next door is 1,710. You know, I want per dollar square foot. It's $100 a foot. I want a $10,000, whatever. And that's just not how yeah, it works. It's just not a big enough area to make that house function right. anymore. You know, once you start exceeding 100 square foot, then we'll start making adjustments for that. Um, and the adjustment right here. Yeah, exactly. So this house was obviously 119 square feet or so smaller than what the subject was. So it warranted an adjustment up. Uh, so how we come up with that, I'm gonna turn that over to Tanner because Tanner is our guru in the uh, regression analysis. So which we'll um, touch base and another here. thing I wanted to touch point on, you know, we talk about bracketing and, and everything needs to be bracketed. Um, here's, a, here's, a, here's an example. So we're looking at our gross living area of our subject at 1,631 foot. Um, due to our regulations and, and to properly bracket this house, we have a home that is smaller and we have a home that is larger. And then we also have a loan, 
a home that is similar in size. So we have comparables one and three that are that are similar in size that require no adjustment. So when we talk about things needing to be properly bracketed, you know, that's an example. We, you know, our, our subject falls right in the middle, essentially, of these homes. So in, in appraisal, that is certainly one major thing that we look for. We don't want to be using comparables that are all smaller or that are all larger. You know, we we do the very best we can to find the most qualified comps on on that that end um, to, yeah. to bracket that. So and real quick, guys. So this is a three bedroom, two bath subject. This comp was a three bedroom, one and a half bath. For that extra half bath, the adjustment's about twenty five hundred bucks. Not a huge adjustment, but they do make an adjustment. Yeah, and you know that's going to vary depending on what price range sure, property you're absolutely. in and the, and the quality and so forth. Yeah, let's if you don't mind, just if if everybody take a look at this, we're going to show you exactly how we came up with the adjustments that we have. Now the let's see, yes, we've got the slide. Uh, should be look at this. Let me look at the top real quick. Look at. Um, Okay, right here, there we go. So this is what we call regression analysis. So this is basically another tool that, that we can use um, in order to determine value. As appraisers, we have multiple tools in order to determine value. It may be um, compared sales data, so um, our paired sales, which we will show some examples of that. This is another tool that we may utilize. So um, I guess the essentially, this is, and this is a regression based out of Willoughby Station in the last 12 months. You know, regressions tend to work better in properties that have multiple sales with, with lots of great data um, in order to run. So we're looking at ultimately 48 observations or 48 sales in Willoughby Station in the last 12 months. And, and the way that we compute this is we, we extract all of this information. Let me scroll up there yeah, just a little bit. And uh, we, we take all of this information actually off of real tracks in the MLS system. So we're able to download it straight from real tracks and, and um, anyone essentially can do this by, by selecting all the sales and, and downloading and you can and have certain categories based on what we think is contributing value in, in Willoughby Station, the major factors that are driving home value in a, in a neighborhood like that or a development is obviously your square foot total, um, your bedroom counts, your bath counts, your garage spaces, and, and condition of the, of the home, you know, at the time of sale. So we're able to extract all of that information and, and basically our sales prices are dependent variable. Um, so, and all these other variables are what influences the sales price. So this computes it by saying, what type of contributory value does each one of these factors have into the sales price? So as you can see here, it, it computes it by saying, um, in, the, in the highlighted yellow areas, this is showing um, that square foot is essentially contributing $58 a foot for um, difference in square footage. So, so that right there is our GLA adjustment in an appraisal in Willoughby Station. You know, if we've got one that exceeds 100 foot, regression is showing us, hey, you know, the, the buyer is willing to spend 58 more dollars per foot. So, and, um, we, and that's not what the houses are selling for per, per foot total, or what we're saying that house is worth per square foot. That's for the differences that we're making adjustments on if you've got a 2,400 square foot house and a 2,501 square foot. That extra 101 square feet is adjusted at 58. Only the differences. That's what it's showing that the average buyer is paying extra for the differences in the square And that's the biggest thing I see as a mistake that is made is like, hey, this is 300 square feet difference or 200 square feet difference, and the house is worth 150 a foot. Therefore, we extrapolate $45,000 difference, and that's not how the adjustments work. So looking at an appraisal and understanding how they bracket it, and this guy's is, you know, we don't expect anybody to, to come away from here and, and do this. This is this is why they get paid the big bucks. This is a, this is you know uh, it's intricate. It's very complicated. It's complex. But this is how they come up with values that they can defend. Five exactly. years from now, he can go in and the judge says, "Hey, I don't like your appraisal," and he can come out and say, "Well, this is how we came up with it. Easily defend it." And he you know he doesn't 
have any any problems that tend to get when they have these complicated things that they that they run against. Yeah. So just a, a couple things too. Um, you see the lower ninety five and the upper ninety five. So essentially, you know, as appraisers, we've we've got to make you know our best decision on um, on where we want to to use in that range. On a, on the smaller homes, we may adjust that at sixty two. Um, you know, because the, the smaller homes are going to sell for more per foot than the larger homes. And maybe the larger homes in that neighborhood, we may adjust at 55 or something. That as long as we are still in that range, um, we are still justifiable at that point. So, and, and that comes back to, to experience and saying, you know, looking at the market and what's typical in the market. And um, just a couple of quick points on, on bedrooms. It's showing that it ultimately um, bedrooms don't have a contributory factor in this neighborhood. Between, showing, a, between a four and a five or between a three and a four. So it's showing that the buyers really aren't willing to pay more for just because a home has an extra bedroom um, in this particular neighborhood. It may be completely different in a regression analysis out elsewhere. You know, it's showing a bath is, is, is roughly $5,000 more in contributory value right now um, in this neighborhood. Uh, garage spaces per bay, you know, are, are indicating $6,700 roughly, you know, so you know, and, and we and we would round that ultimately in an appraisal, um, you know, and make our best decision on that. So uh, this is just another good tool that we can analyze and use um, when we are determining values. Yeah. A quick question. This is not on your list, but uh, I know I've talked to, uh, to Brian about this before, but what percentage of tax records are accurate in Wilson County as far as square footage and, and things like that? Zero. Zero. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure that that's not a hundred. I'm sure there's one or two out there. There may be an anomaly or two. We're still looking for it. So just be very careful when you go meet with a homeowner and, you know, if they don't have a prior appraisal, I see it all the time. People list the house. A tax record says it's 2,200 feet. You get a professional measurement. It comes back at 1,900 square feet. Perfect example yesterday uh, doing an appraisal, and this was a commercial appraisal. Uh, the agent had it listed at 2,000 square feet. It was 4,413 square feet. Ooh. You know, they just like based it off of tax records. Tax records were showing, but tax records were completely leaving out the fact that it had a second floor and a utility wow. that was finished. So, somebody got a good deal? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. They like do happen. People are still getting good deals whenever uh, it, it pays to know exactly what the square footage is, I guess is what I'm trying to drive home. Uh, and, and one of the big things I know we've not covered and probably will later the information that we're getting from MLSs is the biggest information we're using in valuing these properties that we're appraising for you. That goes directly without saying that the more accurate the information is on MLS, the more accurate that value is going to be in that appraisal. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so guys, the next question on your list, and I'm, I'm going to talk about it a little bit. And I'm going to let uh, these guys also tell you from their perspective. Uh, but, if you ask, if you're the listing agent, now we know for the buyer's agent, the first thing we're going to do is ask for a price reduction if the price comes in low. But if you're the buyer, if you're the listing agent, you're the represent the seller, you may want to ask for a reconsideration, right? So if you're going to ask through, for a reconsideration of value through the appraisal management company, you know what info do you need to include? So um, the main thing is take all your opinions and emotions, and I know it's worth more than and what somebody else thinks it's worth, take all that out of it. It's not emotional. So the first thing you want to do is look at the appraisal. And I've had, you know, where we send it out and people call me back. It's like, man, that, you know, that, that, that's crazy. That value can't be. And it's like, well, have you looked at the comps? Well, I haven't even opened the appraisal, but I just know. Well, that's an opinion. So when you get it, remember, they have to follow guidelines. They have to bracket. They have to look at sales. So look at the appraisal first and find those comps, okay? So there's gonna be the main page of comps, and a lot of times, a few pages down on the appraisal, they're gonna have another fourth, fifth, maybe even a sixth comp that supports the value that they come up with. So look at the comps that they've used, and the only thing that's gonna ever change an appraiser's mind is additional comps that are, um, that are new comps that, that he missed, because sometimes there's a for sale by owner or there's something that, that can't be missed. Nobody's perfect, I mean, everybody can make mistakes. or if you happen to know that comp two was actually a non-arms link transaction, and man, I went in that house and that house was actually trashed, and you can't tell it on the MLS. I've had this happen where they said, you know, the MLS made it look great, 
But that thing sold for 40, 50 grand less than it should have because if you talk to the agent, the listing agent, they'll tell you it was it was a mess. And you know, and if appraisers know that information, they can make different adjustments. But you gotta have good information to go back and, and, and please don't just say, I wanna ask for a reconsideration based on Zillow said or based on the tax record is wrong or, or whatever, right? And nobody trusts Zillow, but um, come with good information. If you come with great information, say, hey, please reconsider these two comps. Please look at comp three. Uh, you know, I, I, you know that, that was a distress sale. The seller had to move quick. I know something about that. You can call the agents, and sometimes we do that. We'll call the listing agents on those, those comps and, and see if we can find more information. But you gotta have good information. Like, and especially with big banks, and you know, the, the reality is, you know, a lot of times those guys that work for Quicken Loans, they're just, they don't care. They've done the appraisal, I'm not gonna deal with it. And uh, so can you touch on like, if you ever get a reconsideration, what are you looking for as an appraiser? What information do you want to say, hey, you know what? Yeah, I think you're right. I think I can adjust this value a little bit here and here and, and, and help out. Okay. Uh, you know, we're always open. If, if somebody has a question, and when I say that, as long as somebody has a valid question right. and has justifiable information that they can show us, that, that it lends itself to an opportunity to, to be able to u- be utilized, we're open. We're, per- we're not perfect. We're humans just like anybody else. Uh, but we have certain criteria that we have to use and base our opinions on is why we select the comparable sales that we do in these appraisals. It has to be an arm's length transaction. Qualified comparable sales is what we're using. Number one thing, it has to be an arm's length transaction. It has to be a real sale between a real seller and a real buyer, not friends, not family, that are selling above or below market value. It has to be something that's sold at market value. Um, You know, something in the same neighborhood. You know, we get people asking for a reconsideration all the time, and maybe we're doing an appraisal in East Nashville, and they want us to use an appraisal or a comp sale out of Green Hills. Right. because it's a similar house. Well, it is a similar house, but location, location, location is number one thing you in real estate. You can't cross, generally, you cannot cross zip codes. Yes. You cannot cross the interstate. Major neighborhood you cannot dividers. cross a river. No. <laughs> I've had people that want to, you know, I love Old Hickory. It's a great little neighborhood. They want to hop Old Hickory to East Nashville. Yes, it's two miles as the bird flies, and it's 20 minutes in a car. Exactly. A totally different totally market. Totally different market, different buyer. Yep. Um, but... It, we're open if you know of sales that justify what your thoughts are. As long as they are qualified, we're more than happy to look at them. But if we're appraising a 2,000 square foot house and the 2,000 square foot houses are selling for $150 a square foot to $160 a square foot on average, and you want a reconsideration, we can't use a 1,200 square foot house that's selling for $200 a square foot as comparable. They're that's completely different buyers. 25% of, of what the Well, no, we, we try to stay, and it, and it all depends on how big of a house you're doing. Um, we try to stay no more than 400 square foot difference, you know, on a two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 square foot house. If you're appraising a 800 square foot house, you want to stay within 150 square foot right. high and low max. Uh, but as long as it's a qualified sale, we're more than happy to take a look at it and see if it's something that, that we've missed. But at the same time, we have criteria that our clients that we're working for have stated, you know, you have to have, out of the three comps, you have to have a minimum of two of them that have sold in 30 days. The third one can't be more than three months old. Well, that's a stipulation that they're putting on in a requirement for us that they're needing sales that are right. up, that, that fit those time frames. Right. Yeah, leaders you know. want, they, we want comps now in the last six months. That's, yeah. that's what we want. Um, and right now, that's you know that's everything's moving up, so that's actually usually a good thing. Uh, but it, it makes it challenging. It does. You're, you're ten miles away from town, and you're looking for comps. And man, you know you got a log home here, and there's, you know, it, it can be harder to find comps in the last six months. And when you, you can't, you can justify going out to a year. You can justify going out further in mileage. Uh, you know, I've seen comps that are ten miles away, and it's, it's completely fine because that's the best comp. Generally, in the more rural settings, right. you're going to have to go out. Not a little Willoughby bit Station. Not a Willoughby <laughs> Station. No. So if, if, if we're doing an appraisal in Willoughby Station and, and you've got a reconsideration of value request, please send something from Willoughby Station. Right. You know, we can't use Reich Farms on the other side right. of the interstate, you know, Probably as a comparable. And, and we see that all the time. Yep. Okay. 
Um, question number five, guys, and uh, this is just something that came up that, that, that I wanted to address with everybody. If you add on to a home, like finish a basement, add a detached garage, without pulling a permit, how does that affect the appraisal? Does it affect the value, or do you guys look at, at what permits for? How does that work? Well, obviously we're appraisers, so we observe and report the findings that we see at the property. We do not have the ability to, to know if a permit was pulled 100% of the time. Right. Uh, or if all the legal, proper legal channels were followed in order to build that extra detached garage or that swimming pool or things like that. So there's certain things like this. We have to base these appraisals on the assumptions that they are legally permitted and legally accessible. Or not so assessed, you're going to appraise it based allowed. on what you see. Exactly. Okay. So it's up to you if you're representing the buyer and you see this extra thing over here, if you think it you know, doesn't look right or a permit wasn't pulled, to do your own inspections because they're not inspectors. You know, some people think an appraiser is supposed to inspect the house. They're looking at it for value. They do inspect for safety and some, some very basic things, uh, but they're not going to go inspect that detached garage and make sure it was done to code. Exactly. We're, we're completely different than a building inspector or a home inspector. Cool. Um, so guys, the next question is going to be for me. Uh, so number six is what is a property inspection waiver on a loan and how does a client get it and how does it work? So property inspection waiver is something that we get sometimes. Fannie Mae, uh, Freddie Mac allows it. FHA, USDA, VA does not allow it. If you got a client doing that purchase, they will never, ever, ever, they have to have an appraisal every single time. In some cases, uh, especially on refinances with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, we run it through a system. If they have good credit, they have a down payment, um, we can get, we don't have to have a, an appraisal. So it just, it saves time. It makes it a little bit more of a streamlined process. Uh, and a lot of times it goes back to has that. So whenever an appraisal is done for Fannie Mae, they log the appraisal. So if they got a house that they bought two years ago, Fannie Mae's got a copy of that forever. They know exactly it's a 2,100 square foot house. They know what it was worth two years ago. They have it in their database. So when we go to either do a new purchase or refinance, they already know what it's worth. They know the market generally in Middle Tennessee is appreciated. These people have great credit and down payment. They'll allow for a waiver on the appraisal. So uh, that's how that works. We get them a lot. Uh, saves these guys from having to do all this extra work on stuff that uh, is a low risk because of the borrower, because of the down payment. So that's how that works. And if you have follow-up questions on that, we're, we're glad to answer those later too. Um, number seven, how does Zillow come up with their value and how accurate is it? So Zillow uses tax records, and we just heard that the tax records are correct never, right? But that's how they have to do it. They pull public record, and they say, hey, tax record says this, and then they just basically do an average of square foot. They don't know what the countertops look like. A lot of times they have room counts that are incorrect because tax records are incorrect. So Zillow is a great place to get a ballpark, and you're not going to get an exact figure at all. But if it's in Willoughby Station, it's going to be somewhere in the ballpark. That, that's how I feel about, you know, about Zillow. If it's out on five acres and it's 15 miles from Lebanon and you're pulling a Zillow, good luck on the appraisal matching. It's mm -hmm. not. Uh, so just know, you know, and you guys know that all the clients go to Zillow or uh, what's the new one? Um, I don't know. There's three or four good ones out there to just get a, a roundabout number. But usually I pull the Zillow and I can't remember what the other one is. I have it saved too, but I'll see Twenty or thirty thousand dollar differences on the site the same day on an estimated value. Yeah. And and I'd like one thing I'd like to hit on on that. So, you know, if you're here in Mount Juliet or certain parts of Lebanon, primarily Mount Juliet, uh, if you're looking say somewhere the Highway 70 Lebanon Road corridor north toward the lake, that's considered a neighborhood to Zillow. Yep. Not specifically just Willoughby Station. Yep. So what they're doing, they're analyzing every sale that has transpired in that neighborhood over a given period of time. Which is huge. Area. Well, it's huge. You have 1,000 square foot houses to eight or 9,000 square foot houses. You have lake properties, you have subdivision properties, then you have rural setting properties, which all are completely different buyers, sell at different price points. But they, they, they've got a formula that they use. But in a nutshell, what it is, they average everything out and then apply that factor to every property in that neighborhood. Well, you can't compare a lake house to a thousand square foot or 1500 square foot house over in Shallow. Right. You know, they're completely different animals. So that's where you start seeing the discrepancies in Zillow a lot of times. Yeah. yeah. 
That makes sense. And I, I, don't, I know you guys are all professional and you know how to overcome the Zillow talk with your buyers and stuff like that. So um, and it brings me to question number eight. What about lake homes or unique properties? How do you approach those differently than, a, you know, I say a regular house, but what I'm talking about is a 6,000 square foot house. So in 20 acres, it's out from town or the lake house that's unique. There's not a lot of comparables versus a house in Providence. There's been 75 sales that you can look at yeah. to do that. So how do you approach that report? differently? You know, and I think Tanner will agree with me. Our approach to that property or that type of property is not necessarily any different than the approach that we would have to one in Providence uh, or on North Green Hill Road. We, we, we approach all of them the same. The difference there is the complexity of that assignment. Uh, you know, if you're appraising a lake house, you're only going to analyze comparable sales that are lake properties, like lake, lake front as well. If it's a boat dock lot that you're appraising, you've got to use a boat dock yeah. comparable sale. A lot of times you can go from Mount Juliet and cross the lake to Hendersonville. Is that true or is that not true? We, we never do. Okay, they never do? No, because the, the Gallatin, Sumner County, Hendersonville market is completely different okay. than the Wilson County market. A buyer that is looking at a property in Sumner County is probably less than a less than five percent chance that same buyer would be willing to look in Wilson County at a property on the lake. Makes sense. I mean, they're completely different markets, completely different price points. You, I've seen the exact same house built by the exact same builder on a lake lot in Mount Juliet and a lake lot in Gallatin and sell for over half a million dollars difference. So I mean, it's it's a it's a vast difference in markets. Gotcha. Uh, so that that's that's not, but it's the complexity on unique properties and lakefront properties. Uh, there, if you've got a lake property or if you've got the, this six thousand square foot house on twenty acres, fifty acres, a hundred acres, that is a property of wants, not of needs. Like your house, basic house, somebody's wanting to live in, needing to live in. This is somebody that's got the extra money. They're looking for a particular type of property. So you're, you're having to analyze sales a little bit differently than you are here in town. You know, when you're looking at that lake property, you may have 20 sales of lakefront houses in Wilson County over the last 12 months, but there may only be one, two that are truly comparable to whatever you're appraising. Maybe none, depending on where it's at. Harbor Island, you know, there's no other island on Old Hickory Lake with houses on it, period. Yeah. Harbor yeah. Island is a unique creature, right. you know, so... So you have to make bigger adjustments. Exactly, your adjustments are different. You have to do a lot more regression analysis, paired sales analysis, advanced paired, what we call advanced paired sales analysis, in order to try to extrapolate what kind of adjustments need to be made for those different. They're, they're very complex and, and the, is the nuts and the bolts of They take a lot longer, a lot more research, uh, but the approach to them is generally the same thing. Okay. So that's good to hear. Is I have heard, or I've even seen, you know, some appraisers will cross the lake, but it sounds like you guys have a. Yeah, don't we try to. I mean, it's very rare. I'm not gonna say it's never happened, right? But it's a very rare instance when something yeah. like that happens. It makes sense. I mean, Gallatin's different than Mount Juliet. Mount Juliet's different than Henderson. You know, I've not seen any clients that we've worked for now or in the past. If we were appraising a lake house in Mount Juliet, that would have allowed us to use a lake house in Summer County. Right. It would have when the underwriter received that appraisal and started reviewing it and seeing the proximity yeah. because you have to include a location now. Right. They would have seen that and one hundred percent of the time would have sent it back saying, Hey, absolutely not. We well, got right. to stick within well, that same county and can't cross the there's no there's no connection between the two right. areas. It's a thirty you, minute drive. Exactly. You know 30, 45 mile. minute drive exactly. to get back and forth to either one of them when they're less than a half a mile apart. Right. Right. Awesome. So guys, there are a couple of questions and then we um Look at these and make sure we're addressing this. And um, I haven't not read them all yet. So let me look here. So we got one that says, have you ever seen an appraisal waiver, but it buys the client to get an appraisal because the listed price seemed overpriced or does the waiver take the value into consideration? So the waiver does. So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they have a Zillow evaluation model internally. They don't tell us what, what their evaluation model is, but they have that, but it's, it's way more complex and sophisticated than Zillow because they have literally millions of actual appraisals on file. Okay, so in, in let's say Willoughby Station, we keep using that as our kind of our guinea pig today. I bet you they have half the houses in Willoughby Station, they have an appraisal on file. They know that the square footage is what it is. They know the bedroom counts four and the bathroom counts two and a half. Zillow's guessing based on tax records, okay? 
So their, their evaluation models are much more accurate. So when they give a waiver, they're saying that we accept the value that you put in. They're buying the house for 400. We accept that as the value. And they also take into account the client has a 750 credit score and they're putting down 20%. All that comes into to account. If you change it and you change it to a 3% down payment program, they're probably not going to allow the waiver. They're going to say, nope, we want appraisal because they're only putting down 3% and uh, we need an appraisal because that, that adds to the risk. So it's an overall risk uh, thing that, 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 that dictates that. Um, how do you account for a home on a much larger lot than any other house in the area? Extra land is, uh, and the extra land would not be road fronted. So how would you guys say it's got, and Sarah, you can correct me here, but let's say it's, it's three acres and, and most of the houses in the area are half an acre. How do you guys account for okay. that or just? So, and, and on that, we would, we would look, uh, we would run regression probably at that point and, and look, you know, it's basically, it just really all depends. You know, that's the ultimate factor. If, if it's in a neighborhood or something and you're looking at a lot that's a half acre larger, we can, we can run regression because regression is all based on the, the correlation and sometimes it's a strong correlation, sometimes it's not. So if, if it's, um, if it's a weak correlation, we may not put as much weight on that. And then we may, we may go and start looking at, at paired sales data and saying, you know, and, and look at it that way. So, um, but, uh, but typically, yes, we, you know, we would base everything off regression at that point or paired sales data and, and show, you know, buyers are willing to pay more money for an extra larger lot um, at that point. So. Yeah, she just followed up. Typical yeah, okay. lots are half acre and this is a 2.75 acre. Right. Again, it's gonna depend on what part of town and, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of things. So we're not gonna ask him to make an adjustment on the spot because he would have to do a lot of research, but. Um, but it depends, the usability. Is that extra two and a quarter acres usable? You know, is it able to be split off? You know, typically if you're in a neighborhood of half acre lots and you have an anomaly that's on two and three quarter acre lots, it's generally because that land wasn't worth developing. Right. Or wasn't able to be developed, wetlands, severe topography, uh, utility easements, something like that. Therefore, you just got a bigger yard. Right. Generally, somebody looking to buy a house in a subdivision or development with half acre lots generally does not want the upkeep of a two and three quarter acre lot. Right. So a lot of times that lot may not bring any more at all or very little bit more. It's maybe more appealing to some buyers, mm -hmm. but doesn't have a lot of value. Exactly. Uh, here's a really good question. If the property went into multiple, multiple offer situation where buyers were offered over the asking price, is that something that an appraiser would consider or need to know? Uh, we run into that a lot. I mean, that, that, that helps us determine how much demand is in the market still for that particular type of property or that particular location. Uh, that does not influence us, however, none whatsoever in value. We're still looking at anything that we can justify and support and ultimately prove on the value. But it is good to know to help us in determining the demand, because that's something else that we have to do in the appraisal is determine how much demand is, because we have to let the our client know what's the marketing time to sell that house. You know, how long is it going to take us to sell that house? Right. Um, so here's one representing investors that completely rehab homes, you know, doing a full gut basically on a house. Uh, putting new driveways and patios. How do you comp a completely renovated rehab home, I guess, versus the dilapidated home that, that you know, was before? I mean, you would only be looking, if, you, if you're in a position where you're listing one of those, you need to make sure you're finding other sales that have been updated, remodeled, as similar to that one as possible in order to base your value on, instead of using the ones that are, had no updates at all to them. Right. That's what we would be analyzing. We're not going to be using the ones that have not had any updates. We're going to be looking for those houses similar in age, size, uh, you know, location, and that have had, you know, significant updates, repairs, renovations, and using those as comparables. We're not going to use one that has had zero influence or any, yeah. zero updates or repairs to it. Okay. Uh, here, here's a question about when living space has only temporary or standalone heat and air available, how would that be priced? The living area with only skylights. I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the only skylights, but we have to have a permanent heat source. I'm yes, 100%. Sure. If you don't have permanent heat source, it's not considered GLO. Yeah, so any any house that wants to get a loan, if you're trying to get a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, any kind of loan that we do, 
It has to have a, a permanent heat source. That can be that can be wood burning even. Mm -hmm. It can be a fireplace. Yes. You do not have to have permanent air. Right. A lot, I know that's a misconception. A lot of people think you have to have heat and air. That's not the case. You have to have permanent heat. Yep. You can have window air conditioning units. Right. And, and, and that's fine, but you have to have permanent heat. Uh, if you don't have permanent heat or access to permanent heat, one or two things are going to happen. The, when the appraiser realizes that at the inspection, he's going to call the lender and let him know, hey, here's what I've run into. The house does not have any form of, of a permanent heat source. They're either going to require him, or the, the appraiser, to do that appraisal subject to somebody coming in and putting heat in where they have the permanent heat source, or they may not go through with the loan. We have seen yeah. that happen. Yeah. Yeah, we have to have heat to do the loan. And typically, just another point on that, it's it can be difficult when you say, um, how would that be priced? So um, it can be difficult to find paired sales on something like that. So we would look at it more from a cost approach method. So if we're looking at a home with, with only window units versus a, a home that's that's got a central HVAC system, you know, we if we are unable to find paired sales that, um, that indicate that the difference in value, we may look at it from what's called our cost approach method. You know, how much would it ultimately cost to um, to put a central HVAC system on that home, and then we can make adjustments accordingly based on that. So, cool. uh, there is. Do you consider differences in quality of construction on below grade footage? For instance, drop ceilings and concrete floors <clears throat> versus nine foot ceilings and recessed lighting and hardwood flooring. Again, this is a basement house that either is kind of just the basic or is really upgraded and finished nice. Yeah, 100% of the time we consider that. that yeah. I mean, that is a significant factor. You want to go to that um, paired sales where it's yeah, we can. high quality. I don't that know if you've you got to, we'll, we'll take just a moment on that one. So on this Sorry. basement, let's just really get this there. one. So this right, is what, me, uh, I gotta go back to share. Hang on one second, guys, I'm gonna share my screen again. All right. So basically, we've been talking about paired sales, paired sales this whole time. So this is a this is a great example. So this is cell number one, and this is what would be considered a perfect paired sale. There are no other differences in this prop in these two properties. This is property one, and I'm about to show you property two. This is an attached HPR in East Nashville. Um, the only difference in these two homes, they sold on the same day, um, a fifty thousand dollar price difference. This this particular home here has a full unfinished basement at 1,456 square foot. It sold for 529.9. Um, comparable two that I'm about to show you now shows that this has the exact same home. It, they're literally identical plans. They're identical everything. Um, the only difference is a $50,000 difference in value, and this comparable had a full finished basement area so 1456 square foot of finished area so our difference as you can see there's we've got highlighted is 39 dollars and 18 cents per square foot so this is a perfect paired sale showing hey the a buyer is willing to pay roughly 40 dollars per foot for finished basement area in that, that particular market in this market yes so and, and this is good quality finished i mean you're caught on the, you've got a two bed a one bath it's very good it matches the same quality as the above grade rest of the house. So this is a, a great example of, of what paired sales is and how we would extract a, a basement adjustment. Here. So. Awesome. All right, let's get back to, did everybody else see the screen or was I, was that not? We got some messages that maybe y'all couldn't see that. Hopefully you could. Could you guys see the screen that I was sharing? Okay, um, let's see. I'm gonna go back up to some of these older questions. That we, we talked for a while and I know there's some other questions up here. Okay. Um, at what point is the age difference significant and changes the value like in approximate years? So if you got like a 60 year home versus a 20 year old home or how, how does that work? So the biggest differences, or the most significant changes you're going to see in that is during new construction, the first 10 years of a house life. Okay. You'll see more change in value year over year than you will a house that's already hit 20 years to 40 or 50 years old. Very little change there. 
um, in comparison to other homes in you know the same age. Uh, you know, we try to avoid, if at all possible, uh, using a house. You know, say if, if we're doing houses less than ten years old, we want to stay within two to three years age difference max, if at all possible. As long as there are sales in that area, you know. Uh, if you go to a subdivision that has houses that are still being built, some houses 10 years old, you cannot use a new construction comparable sale for a 10 year old house. It's yeah. two completely different yeah. buyers. Somebody's wanting a new house, wanting to spend a little bit extra money to get that new house, instead of buying that house that's 10 years old that already is fixed yeah. to have a new roof here in a few years central heat and air in a few years and things like that. So you would not use those. And I see that a lot guys where, you know, somebody's doing a resale in a neighborhood, say Jacksonville, they've lived here for four or five, six years, mm -hmm. maybe at this point. And you know, you're buying a house that's five years old and they want to comp it to the one that just sold last week. And yeah, it's the same square footage, but we all know if, if I'm buying a new, a brand new car, I'm going to pay a little more than that car that's been used for five years. It's it, not the same percentage wise on the house. Exactly. But somebody's always going to be willing to pay for the paint they want, the finish they want. Nobody's ever lived here. Nobody's ever took a shower. And that's my, it's all mine. It's brand new. They're going to pay more than that house that's five years old. So you just have to make an adjustment. You can use it as a comp sometimes, but you have to adjust. If you have no other comps that are better, more qualified. So, you know, very rarely do we ever get a reconsideration of value, you know. Yeah. But when we do, that's generally what is always given to us. It's we're appraising a house that's, in a subdivision or a development where they're still doing new construction and the house we're appraising is five or 10 years old yep. and the comps that are sent to us saying, well, hey, we want a reconsideration of value. You only gave us $160 a square foot. There's all kinds of comps that support $170 a square foot. Well, there are sales at $170 a square foot, but they're brand new construction and a lot better quality than what the houses were built 10 years ago. We can't use those right. whenever we're putting a value on that 10 year old house. It's a completely different product, a completely different buyer. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, one more question is good. Does every appraiser have to measure square footage? No. It, and it depends. It depends on what type of an appraisal you are doing and what your lender's requirements are or what our client's requirements are. If it's a full appraisal, yes, you, the appraiser will measure that house. There are different forms of appraisals. There are drive-by exterior-only appraisals that the appraiser is going to drive by, look at your house from the street, but all the information that they're going to use in that appraisal that is, say, pertains to square footage, your bill, quality, condition, everything else, they're relying 100% on tax record and MLS. It's not up to the appraiser to determine what type of appraisal is being done. Right. The client is re requesting a specific appraisal. So we order, anytime it's an FHA or a government, USDA, VA is always going to have full measurements. And most of the time on Fannie Mae, every now and then, especially with COVID, they, they changed some rules around uh, COVID to where these guys don't have to go in every house and we had some exterior only, didn't have to measure um, type of things. So I think that answers kind of all the questions. There might be a couple more here at the bottom. Uh, do you have the contracted price when you receive the assignment on a purchase? Yes, absolutely. They have a full contract. So, yes. And we and we analyze all contracts to, you know, just kind of look and see, is, is there anything going on with that contract? So, is this an arm's length sale? Is there some sort of concessions that may be affecting the, the, the value in some way? So, so we certainly... Um, we want to look, we want to see the contract and make sure it's an arm's length transaction and, and see if there's something going on that, that maybe, you know, that, that might stand out in some way and, and make sure nothing like that's going on. Yep. Um, and then last question, guys, um, is living area required to have a window to qualify as living area or is that only a consideration of a bedroom? So if you've got like a, I guess a bonus room or like okay. an interior room. Yeah, not not all rooms are required to have a window. Right. Bedrooms are. That, that's for fire hazards. Yes. Right? Yeah, bedrooms are, uh, and spe specifically a basement. You know, we've run into houses before where somebody had dug out for a basement, built the basement foundation, but they never built the house above the basement. Uh, and they ended up finishing the basement out and just put a, a roof over top of the wow. basement. So the house is completely below grade except for the, the one door going in and out. So crazy. 
Super dangerous. <laughs> super dangerous. <laughs> zero know. square foot so there's, GLA house. If, if something happens, you know, somebody's in the bedrooms were at the very back of this, you know, so if a fire, fire breaks out, out, there's no way out. So it's a safety hazard. So as an appraisal appraiser, we have to look at soundness, safety, and structural integrity. Those are three major components we have to factor anytime we're looking and doing our inspections on a property. If it violates any of those three standards or any of those three situations, we immediately have to, you know, put a pause on things, contact our client, let them know what we've discovered, and then determine what's the best way to proceed. If you've got a door and a and two doors instead of a door and a window, does that count as a bedroom interior? We have a, a very so nice one. Two doors, doors don't fall two doors, bedrooms. Bedroom. No. So all you only have to have one door for a bedroom. One door and a window, or and two a bit doors? one door and a. Okay, that's kind of crossing a different thing. You have to have an ingress and an egress. Right. So whether that's the form of two doors or a door and a window, either one is fine. Right. In order to be considered a bedroom, you have to have a closet. There has to be a functioning closet. If there's no closet, it is not a bedroom in appraisal standards. That's not the appraiser making that decision. Right. That is the appraisal guidelines yeah, telling us that. Uh, and then last question, guys, this is actually a really good one. And, and it was on the appraisal. Do you compensate for time of sale uh, difference in a fast appreciation mar appreciating market? So I'm going to share that again because, uh, we got that. where was it? This one? We'll go back to the old This session. one right here. Let me cover this real quick. No, it's right here, right? Time of sale. Well, yes, but we've got a pair of sales. Oh. We went back and, and did and showed exactly what the appreciation is. Um, okay, yeah, yes, this is it. Yeah. So, this is kind of a breakdown here of how we and, and we use multiple methods in order to, to make time of sale adjustments. But, uh, this is basically analyzing, and again, we're going back to Willoughby Station. This is just kind of the, the sample that we used for this. Um, but so, so here we're analyzing all the sales from 2018 to 2019 from um, June 5th or whatever my effective date may have been on this. And then we're getting, and then that is the above stat line. This you know, series. And, and you see that the, the average. You guys, we can't see this. We can't see the screen. 8,892. Um, oh, hang um, on. I'm on the wrong screen. Sorry, guys. Give me one second. I got to reshare the screen. This one. Sorry. Okay. So we're looking at, at uh, the above um, parameters are 2018 to 2019 sales in Willoughby Station. So let's say I'm doing an appraisal in there. I'm going to determine um, how much appreciation has, has been going on in that neighborhood. So um, the average sales price in there for 2018 to 2019 was 339892 So then we move forward to 2019-2020, um, which is these um, this box here. So, so you clearly see we went from 339,000 to 358,412 um, on our average sales prices alone um, over those two years. So at that point, we can say um, that there's been a percentage change from 2018, 2019, 2019, 2020 of 5.44%. So um, Willoughby Station is showing roughly a, a five and a half percent appreciation per yeah. year. Um, and then we can, or 0.45 per month, we can look back at this quarterly and say, is, is there any changes going on quarterly? We can, we can look back over three years, five years, you know, and there's multiple methods that we use for, for market conditions. This is just one of them. Um, but, uh, you know, clearly we're still at 5% roughly um, in that, in that neighborhood right now. So we would adjust those comps, you know, accordingly at, at 5.4. Um, and that's what we did in that prior appraisal. Um, it was a different market, different assignment, but but that is just an example of how we we approach market yeah. condition and adjustments. So they absolutely make uh, time adjustments. So if, you know, if the comp sold in February and market's improving, they will make an adjustment to, to show that on your, your sale that's closing. In July, so um, yeah, so five of y'all texted me and said you couldn't see the screen. Sorry about that. So guys, how do we turn this into money, right? So you guys, hopefully, who who learned some about appraisals today? I did. Um, so this is this is huge. This is great information that a lot of people don't have. So how do you turn this into money? This is a great opportunity to call your database and say, hey, I just learned a lot about appraisals. 
Are you thinking about selling, uh, selling your house if you own the house, right? Also, the market's going up. If you're thinking about buying a house, it's probably a great time to do it while interest rates are low, lock it in. So here's one thing that you can do. And this is kind of self-serving for me and the loan officers here in the, in the office, but I've had a couple of agents doing this and it really works. Right now, you can call your database, people you've sold houses to in the last two, three, four, five years and say, hey, did you know that rates are really good? Are you thinking about selling house your house in the next two years. If they're thinking about selling the house, their house, that's a lead for a listing for you, right? And maybe coming up in three to six months. If they're not thinking about selling their house, if they don't want to sell in the next two years, they really need to take advantage of the low rates and say, hey, I've got a great lender. You know, even if they go back to their lender, they need to take advantage. It's a great time for you as their realtor to say, hey, did you really know? It, it's funny how rates have been at historic lows. If you listen to the news and advertisements, they've been at historic lows for 10 years. But now they actually are there, right? So, you know, five years ago, rates weren't that great. People still advertise rates are at historic lows. Right now, they really are. It's a great time to reach out to your clients and say, hey, if, you, if you're going to be in the house long term, look at refinancing. Oh, you're actually thinking about selling in the next two years. When can I come out and take a look at the house and get it prepared and, and, and get a listing for yourself? So, again, it's just you need to be the, the person, the expert that when your, your clients want to know uh, what their house is worth, if they have a question about taxes, guys, Davidson County, you got clients in Davidson County, they just passed a 32% um, tax increase last night. Call your clients and say, hey, just wanna give you a heads up, this is what's coming up. They think about you as their professional realtor, right? When it comes to real estate, you wanna be the person they go to ask questions. If they have a leaky roof, really you want you to be the person they ask who to call. If they call you and say, hey, I got a leaky roof, Awesome, I've got a roof, I'm gonna send them to you. Next month they call you, hey, you know what? I'm tired of this leaky roof, I want a new house. They're gonna call you and you're that person that's professional. So guys, who can call 10 people out of their database every day, have a conversation about what's going on in the market, rates are low, if you haven't refinanced, you need to. Are you thinking about selling? Who, who can do that? I can do it. Everybody should be raising their hand, right? That's a ton of business, I promise you, that's out there. Uh, and if you don't have a great database, because I know not everybody does, Look in your cell phone. Most of your clients are in your cell phone, your sphere of influence, people who, uh, who know you and like you and trust you. You can call 10 out of your cell phone every day, have a conversation about the market and let them know when the time comes that you want to be that realtor. So guys, big round of applause for our guests today. I know y'all can't, we can't hear you, but we can see you. Donna, I like Donna Goff. She has a little emoji yeah. up there. Uh, she, she's quick on it too. So, uh, so big thanks to you guys. Appreciate you coming out. Hopefully you learned something. You know, we, we don't get paid to, uh, to do these lunch and learns. We want to be a resource for you. We want to bring you value. That's why we do it. If you know other people, other realtors in your office that could find value from this, please bring them, invite them. We would love to have them. And of course, if you have folks that uh, we can get pre-approved and ready to go, we would love that opportunity. I always say this almost at every lunch and learn, our favorite lead is somebody who's already pre-approved the big bank. If they come to you and they have a letter from Quicken Loans or a big bank, we want to give them a second opinion. We feel like we give better service. We can show them the value of working with a local lender. Um, so, and I know a lot of agents, they'll, they'll, they say they are, they're already pre-approved with a big bank and they won't let them get a second opinion. They can still choose to use whoever they want, but have them get a second opinion with, uh, with me or, or one of our guys. And uh, we would love the opportunity to show them uh, the difference in what we can do. So guys, y'all have a great day and uh, we look forward to seeing you next month. Bye.